All right, we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to talk about heavy weather sailing. Uh, Jay Johnson is going to do uh, the presentation. Jay has been in use for 12 years now, and coincidentally has raised Harvest Moon for 12 years. Wow, is that that's not? But they sell every year. He's been sailing for 43 years. <laughs> But if he doesn't look as old as some of the other experienced sailors around here, it's because he started when he was four years old. Wow. That's cool. Uh, is that why he started Williamson? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in that time, he sailed 27,000 miles offshore and has visited 22 countries in five years of little work cruising. Well done, Jake Johnson. <laughs> Lakewood is privileged to have him here as a member of our board of directors for the last, uh, it says three weeks. How the time flies. Right. No, he was starting here four years old after all. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Jay. And Jay's going to do everybody a, a solid here because the other Jay, also we call a fan of life, uh, we're going to do a drawing for a door prize. Our, one of our sponsors, West Marine, has donated uh, a nice set of binoculars. Uh, I happen to use those very binoculars, and they're very great. So, uh, Jay, if you would do the honor to just select the name. Gregory Way. No way. No way. No way. Great here. He said he didn't have to be here because he caught the class at eight twice. Ah. Uh, so pull another. It says that his boat's name is Trot. Pull another name. Must be present to win. Okay. At least online. I saw him yesterday, and that's what he told me. <laughs> Kenneth Woman, Sanctuary. Oh, oh, oh. Really wanted to be there. 
<laughs> and I, so I think what we're going to talk about today is, is, is how to avoid being in that, and if you are caught in it, how do we prepare ourselves to, to, to do, um, to keep, keep safe, basically. So let me figure it out if I can, I can do this correctly if everybody else is having problems. And I didn't do it right. A little error on the right. All right, the space bar, great. All right, so I think we're going to go over the things that we need to do before we're going to go out racing. There's a lot of stuff that's important to do before we race. And then during the race, uh, how do we look for the, the signs of, of bad weather? And then if you are caught in bad weather, how do you deal with them to make it out safe? That's, that's kind of what I'm going to go over today. Um, so there's another race that's, that's out in, uh, that happened just a few, few weeks ago or about a month ago. Um, they do the Port Huron to Mackinac, which is basically Detroit to Mackinac, and then they do the Chicago to Mackinac, which is from Chicago to up to northern Michigan. Um, the Port Huron to Mackinac race was a, a, a drifter, which I don't really like drifters, it's not very fun. The Chicago to Mac race was this year was, um, they knew there was going to be bad weather ahead of time, and a lot of people prepared for it, um, and it, was, it blew 50 knots this year. Um, the good news about it is that no one got injured, there is no, no deaths or no Coast Guard rescues, no nothing like that. Um, and one of the things is that a lot of people withdrew. Um, you know, a lot of people realize when they're out there, I don't want to do this anymore, and they withdrew. And I think one of the guys uh, who, who did the race, they said, um, <laughs> he said a quote, that if you can imagine being outside in a thunderstorm, and it goes from no wind to like sticking your head out of a window at highway speeds with lightning and drenching rain. I think if anybody's been out in a 50 knot storm, that's kind of what it's like. It's, it's, it's just not fun to be out there. Um, and, and a lot of boats did uh, withdraw. And I think that the guy who, who, who was a PRO said that you have to remember that the most important thing is to make it to the island in one piece so they can race with us next year. I think that's the same thing with us. We all want everybody to do multiple harvest moves. So please, when you're out there, just think about that. Of, of getting back to safe so we can do it again. If we ever have a thing where it's going to be 50 knots and you don't want to do it anymore, we need to get, get out of the race and, and make sure we're safe so we can race again. Um, if anybody's looking at that picture, I think the wind meter on it is, is not correct. Um, that's supposed to be 50 knots, not 9 knots right there. But. Um, all right, so we're going to start talking about things to do before the race. Um, one of them is, is clothing. Uh, you know, if you're stuck out and it's, it's blowing and raining and drenching and the wind's 30 knots and you're having, you know, if you're on the rail or whatever and waves are coming over, you're going to want to have proper clothing. It is October this year. It's going to be early October. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be nice and warm. Um, I feel like we're kind of like in a false fall or early fall. I don't know. It seems like it's a little bit colder than normal in September. Um, so make sure that everybody in your crew has the, the proper equipment. Uh, you know, I know on our crew, sometimes you have eight people or so, and six of them are fully prepared. Make sure that that seventh person and that eighth person also has everything. Because if you have one person out there with the wrong clothing, that can be really dangerous to everybody else. Because if you have one guy who has hypothermia, then uh, that's, that's going to cause a lot of problems for everybody. Um, so good foul weather here is good. Don't wear cotton. Um, you know, it's just if you get it wet, you're going to be miserable out there. Uh, so, just some clothing. The, the, one of the biggest things that I know that, that is for a captain uh, out sailing for as long as we did with my wife um, is the weather. You have to know the weather. Uh, and, and you need to do it yourself. You can't expect the race committee to, to tell you exactly what the weather is going to be. Um, you kind of have to know going into it what it's going to be like. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, one of them that I really like is the Fleet Numerical Meteorology and Oceanography. Oceanography, sorry, that one. Um, it's basically the military's website. Uh, you know, the military has billions of dollars of equipment out there, the Navy. Um, and so they have some of the best weather prediction in the world. And you're taxpayers, so you get to have it too. <laughs> and so that, that, I think, is one of the best places. They have a good forecast out for about 11 days out. And it is usually pretty darn accurate. Um, so I start looking at that one 11 days out. Because a lot of the, um, the other models, 
so GFS and, and all the other ones, they usually predict about six days out. Um, Fleet Numerical does a much better job. Um, so you can start looking, if you go to their website, there's a bunch of stuff, you can go to the Gulf Center. Um, that picture there is of, uh, I think, um, the Gulf region that I usually tend to look at for the harvest moon race. And you can look at other regions too to kind of get what's happening in the Caribbean and see what's happening coming up, if there's a low coming up. Um, you can look at significant wave heights, you can look at the, the wind speeds and get to know it. Um, another one, you know, I know local forecast is pretty good, like Space City Weather. Um, that one's good for seeing if there's any tropical disturbances coming up. Um, the guys over there give a really, really good kind of overview of what's happening. Um, if there's going to be a cold front coming, I know, uh, you know, in 2019, uh, when that, that storm came, I, I, I don't know if anybody did know it was coming. You should have known it was coming. It was, it was predicted, and it pretty much was spot on exactly when it was going to hit. So if you know that going into it, you can kind of figure out this a little bit on what you need to do for it. Um, other ones like WindFinder, NOAA's going to predict wind. Um, there's a bunch of things out there. Just check the weather ahead of time and get to know what's going to possibly be happening. And just get ready for it. If it looks like it's going to be a drifter this year, then great, it's a drifter. If it looks like there's a possibility of a, of a cold front coming, you just need to know when it's going to be coming and, and, and what to do for it. And if you have any questions along the way, um, it's going to be a discussion too, so um, feel free to ask questions. All right, vessel conditions. So <laughs> if you're going to be doing heavy weather, say like, look at your boat. See whether or not your boat's ready. Like, I mean, so if you looked at the weather and it looks like it's maybe going to be 30 knots and they're still going to do the race, I know, I know in some cases, Dave, it's going to maybe, if it's going to look like really bad weather, we might uh, not do the race. Um, that's up to them. But you always need to look and see whether or not your boat is ready for heavy weather. Um, you know, inspect it, inspect your rating. You can inspect it yourself, make sure it's all good. You can also go and there's plenty of riggers in town that will do an inspection for you for not that much to make sure that your rigging is actually pretty good. Um, your through holes, like, you know, just look at your through holes. If you go to your through hole and it looks like, oh, I shouldn't even try to open or close that, it's gonna fall off. Maybe you should try to figure out that that might be an issue. You know, bouncing along waves and, and hitting waves uh, in, in a storm, uh, it, you know, it might have problems with your through holes. Uh, your motor, make sure your motor can turn on, make sure it's, it's, it's maintained. Because um, that's your friend in heavy weather. If it goes really bad, you're going to want your motor um, to work. Uh, your sheets and lines, you know, have they been sitting out for like 10 years in the Houston sun, and it looks like you're going to pull on them with a lot of stress, and they're going to pop or break or halyards. I mean, things like that. Just make sure that those are, are good too. Because um, if your boat's ready, then you probably will be ready too. I mean, if you go out there saying, "Oh my God, my boat's ready for heavy weather," your mentality of, of being able to be out there and captain your boat and keep everybody safe is probably going to be a lot more. It's going to be better. So, yeah, don't go out with that boat. That boat looks pretty bad. I would not suggest. That. <laughs> I would not suggest that. Um, you know, safety equipment. I think David has a good uh, this, the the safety equipment regulations or rules and all that stuff. That list. Read it. Make sure that you have everything on it. Um, a lot of that stuff is really good. Uh, and there's some extra stuff that I might have on my list of things. Um, red headlines. I don't know if you guys have headlines or anything like that, but red ones at night are great, so you keep your night vision. Um, if it's really gone bad, uh, you kind of don't want to have spotlights all over your boat trying to find stuff because you can. You really want to keep that night vision, especially if you're out in heavy weather. Um, you know, flashlights again. You know, the the lights. Uh, have your flight jackets, I think, and, and have, a, have them with the rings. Make sure everybody on your boat has the rings, and and they also, you can do the crop traps and all that stuff. But make sure you have good life jackets, um, and also good overboard equipment. Uh, the, the, that's probably the, for the safety stuff. Also, I, I know we've talked a lot about the safety gear and things like that in the past, but uh, those are the two two big ones. I mean, your life jackets will, will save you in the end if you have a lot of problems. Um, the other thing I'd say beforehand is to uh, to plan shifts. I know everybody's their own captain and everybody does it a different way. Uh, and I'll just say what I've done and what we've done successfully with my wife on our boat when we were cruising is have shifts because if you're going to hit really bad weather, then it's better to be rested. Um, if everybody's just up and, and like, okay, let's go to bed, and everybody wants to go to bed at one, and it leaves like two people on board or one person on board, and they really want to go to bed, it's much better if you plan shifts. 
I know on our boat we start at um, we start at 6 p.m. And if it's lighter wind, we do three-hour shifts. If it's heavier wind, we do two-hour shifts. And we make sure that we have enough people on each shift to, that know how to work together and know how to man the boat. We have drivers and we have other people who aren't necessarily drivers. But we have a team that works together and that team on each shift knows what to do. And if heavy weather hits, then, then you can have a rested crew ready to go that uh, will come on the next shift. Uh, and you just, it's just a little bit more safe, I think. Um, and we also do uh, a, a, a game or a, I don't know, we have a prize on our boat of the, the fastest crew. Um, so we have a little little race. Whoever gets the highest boat speed on a shift wins a bottle of rum. So you can make it fun too. <laughs> Just kind of have a little fun with it. Um, and then I would say to do the overboard drill test, you know, it's actually a requirement in the, the, the uh, the SIRS, is it called the SIRS or something? I think you're, you're supposed to do at least once with your crew an overboard uh, overboard test. I mean, it, if you can get your crew out on another race, that's great. At least do it on the way to the start. You know, uh, it, it, it's it's something that's important to make sure that your overboard um, drill is, is good so that you have, at least have done it once in the daylight. Because if you're going to actually have to have to, to do it out on the race and it's heavy weather, oh my gosh, it's near impossible. So at least do it once in decent weather. Um, yeah, we, we lost a, a kayak overboard um, going to the Bahamas in the Gulf Stream and the waves were, I don't know, 15. It was blowing like maybe 30. So not super bad, but the waves were stacked up and the, the bow was going under and the kayak just came off. And we're like, we were, we were young, just two of us, and we were, you know, a little stupid. But we said, let's get the kayak back. And I swear, you can't even find the dang thing. I mean, you're up and down, and it's near impossible. We did get the kayak back, but uh, it was it was really hard. So so it's not going to be as easy as you think to get people back on your boat if you're out there and someone happens to go over. So at least trying to, to do it in, in, at once in, in good weather is good to do. Um, another thing is jack lines. I know a lot of people use jack lines. Just make sure you know how to use them properly. Um, like, don't put them on the outside of the shrouds. Like, if you're going to put your jack lines, just have one guy at the dock go, and, and especially the guy or the girl, whoever, that's going to go up front, actually use them to see that they can get up front in good weather. Because all of a sudden, if you have to go up front, you're like, oh my gosh, why is this going under this sheet? And you have to unclip and then go around and then clip back in. That is super dangerous, and you don't want to be doing it in, in 30, 40 knots. So make sure that you get your jack lines done correctly at the dock. And, and there's plenty of articles on how to do it. I'm not going to exactly tell you how to do it, but make sure they're tied down, clean it to something hard on both sides, and have the ability to, to run the whole length of the boat. Because that's going to be the most important thing. Even in not super heavy weather, if it's at night, I always will tie in. If you're going to go up in the front, even if it's a drifter, always be cleaning it because you never know what's going to happen. Uh, those jack lines can save your life if you accidentally just trip or something and fall. You know, it, you'll be at least slipped in, and we don't have to go find you like a kayak. So, um, let's see. Yeah, uh, I say always come back with the same number of people you left. Um, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good motto. And, and the jack lines are very important with that. I think that's that's a good good part of it. All right. So when it starts getting really rough. Uh, I know in 2019 uh, it was it was a it was a it was a pretty decent race and so even before the, the wind um, died and then, then went to 40 or 50 knots. Um, I think it was blowing 20 and it was a it was a little rough. And I know on our boat we had eight people and two people got seasick. Um, and it was really difficult having seasick people on your boat. Um, so if you know you get seasick. Do something beforehand because when it's you're out there and it's really bad, you're going to it, not be able to do much it, when it happens, right? Um, so if you know that you can take Dramamine or those little um, acupressure bracelets or something, whatever your regimen is, do it beforehand. And especially if you know the weather's going to be bad. Um, I know one of the guys in our boat, um, he went down to go change into his foul weather gear because it got to start getting rough. And that was when he got seasick because he went down below for like four minutes. And and I know that's one of the bad things. I know when it gets really rough, and uh, 
Uh, my wife and I were out in heavy seas, and we just wouldn't go down below. We just sleep in the cockpit. You know, I know that's uh, it, it, it's just it's very quick to to transition your brain into being just all of a sudden seasick, and then you can't get over it. And then it takes hours and hours to get over it. So anyway, it's a huge problem, um, and, and don't take it for granted in the beginning if you if you have propensity to get seasick. Um, all right. So I'm going to go over some of the signs of bad weather. Um, how many, uh, I, I guess, there's, if you've already done the, the research into your weather and you know something's coming and you're kind of out there, here's the things to look out for. Um, I know on our boat, when you're in nature for five years, you, you get pretty in tune with, with stuff. You can all of a sudden go, oh, well, look at that cloud over there. That's going to be raining on us in about 15 minutes. Or you look at that thing over there, and that's, oh my gosh, that looks like Mordor, right? <laughs> like all of a sudden, the orcs are like, boom, boom, boom. I mean, you know it's going to be bad by, by some of how dark these clouds come. And, and, that, and the things that we're probably going to be running into are, are cold fronts, right? So, um, or tropical moisture. I think those are the two things that are probably going to hit is either tropical low is going to form around, around us, or there's going to be a cold front coming from the north. Both of those will probably be predicted at least a day or two ahead of time. So you can look out for either one of those cases. Um, in, in the case of a cold front, it probably looks like this, right? There's obvious signs on what's going to be in front. There's like a, a barometer will drop, the wind, wind will die, temperature will change. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of obvious that things are going to happen. And when that does, you know, you need to get ready. You need to prepare yourself for whatever is in that Mordor, right? It's, it's going to be not so great. Um, so that that's a perfect picture of, of a, a cold front there. Um, other ones would look something like, like this. Um, you know, it looks like you're kind of already in something. Um, prepare for more. If you're going to be going underneath that, get ready. Get ready for it. Um, like it's, it's not going to be good. Uh, and then here's another one. That one's a nice looking one. So you can see that air pressure is just kind of, kind of going and dropping down, and and in hitting hitting the the hot, warm air, hitting the cold air, right? And at those boundaries is where you can have super high winds. So, who here was in 2019? Who who is uh, who did that race and, and who did that that cold front, right? Yeah. And what was the wind before that cold front hit? Zero. Zero, right? And did everybody, how many people saw the front coming when it was coming? Pretty much all of us. And how many people reefed? Oh, it was less hands. I see less hands. Not everybody rose their hands. Most people did. I think, you know, that's, I'll talk about that in a second, but, but I think that's one of the main things is that when you start seeing this stuff, you're going to see the wind completely die. And at that point, you should start going like, uh oh, you know, something might be coming. And I know you're trying to sit there and go, I really want to stay in this race. I really want to stay in this race. And you should, but you should also think about, it's zero now. Instead of thinking, let's put up the giant light wind spinnaker. Let's put the, the light wind sails. You might think, in 10 minutes, we're going to be hitting 40. Let's maybe reef the sail. Let's maybe, um, you know, roll in the Genoa and things like that. Um, so it, that's, that's for the, 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 the fronts. Um, thunderstorms also can be out there, right? So more tropical stuff would be thunderstorms. If you see it uh, coming on a thunderstorm too, you can obviously see, see thunderstorms. There's a big black cloud over there. Um, if possible, if the big black cloud is over there, go the other way a little bit. <laughs> you know, I know Jen and I used to be on the boat and, and we use radar. Um, and I know not everybody has radar in the race, but if you do have radar and it is thunderstormy, I'd turn it on and look at it, you know, uh, if you have the ability. I know a lot of people don't have generators and things like that to keep the radar on, but if you have radar, you can see thunderstorm cells on your radar, and you can plan a course, hopefully, that you can get away from it just a little bit, so you don't have to go through a thunderstorm. I know if it's if it's light wind and you want to go through a thunderstorm because you're all prepared for it because there'd be more wind in it, all, um, hats off to you, right? But be prepared for that heavy wind in the thunderstorm because it will happen. Um, that's what else we got. Um, this won't happen as much, but if you see one of these, just avoid it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're not good. They usually happen around thunderstorms. I don't know if they happen around here that much. I've seen a few of them. 
just know that don't, don't go near them to kind of look at them and say, oh, well, that looks kind of cool. I want to get a picture of it. They are really bad. They're, they're not super good. Um, <laughs> all right. So this guy is obviously in some weather. He, he looked at it. He had the light wind area. He saw the front coming. And look, he's, uh, he's going through it. He has a plan, it looks like. Uh, he took his Genoa down. That's, that's very good. Um, and his, his main uh, reef. Uh, and they have a plan. So I think they were good. Uh, are you going to be good too? So if you are stuck in the storm. So we're sitting there in 2019. There's no wind. Uh, what are you thinking as a captain? I'm thinking to myself, it's going to hit us. Um, I need to roll my Genoa in. I need to think about reefing my main and reef it to a point. I need to make sure the crew's ready. I'm making sure that all our safety gear is ready. I'm making sure all of our lines are ready, ready. everything's organized, everything's clean. Um, you know, especially on roller furling boats, you need to be prepared a little bit earlier. Uh, if you don't roll your Genoa in and it's blowing 40 to 50, it's going to be almost impossible to get it back in, right? I mean, how many people have tried to get a, a Genoa in like 30, 40 knots? And it's not fun. It's that little teeny roller furler thing. There's the, the, the line, our sheet lines are big. That little roller furler line is super teeny. It's not meant to be pulled in at, at when it's 50 knots out. So I always get the Genoa in first because it, chances are it's going to try to come out on its own. Um, and, and that's another, another problem, is that you probably want to make sure that you're not going to have your gentleman uh, go out as well. Um, you know, make sure if you have a, 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 not a furling boat, our boat's a furling boat, so we always make sure that we furl a uh, good reef beforehand. But if you have a non-furling boat, make sure you have all your reef lines set. You know, your reef points need to be set ahead of time. You can't sit there all of a sudden and go like, wow, it's 50 knots. Let's go put those little teeny lines in on the reef and get it, you know, get it all done within 50 knots. I mean, that's one plan. That's not the plan I would want to do. <laughs> I mean, that's one way of doing it. So, um, you know, and if, if you see something coming, hopefully you're not running a spinnaker. Um, I would have gotten that down too before the storm. You know, after, because a lot of times, when it's, especially when a front hits, the first 10 minutes is going to be the worst. You know, so weather the first 10 minutes, take your spinnaker down if you're running a spinnaker. And then after the 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, you see, okay, it's not blowing 40 or 50 anymore. Maybe it's now blowing 25. And you're like, okay, that's fitting. Maybe I can start thinking about unreefing my sails, right? And then another 40 minutes, and you're like, okay, it's back down to 17. Throw your spinnaker up. Do whatever you want because you're back down to 17 knots or 15 knots, you know. But in the beginning of it, it's going to be really harsh for the first 15 minutes or so. So make sure you have it, have it down. Um, going forward in a storm, this is, I, I never like to leave the sanctuary in the cockpit, but I always make somebody else do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so whoever you're sending up there, make sure that they know what they're doing, that they have a plan, that everybody has a plan. Um, in heavy weather, if we ever do any sail changes or anything like that in heavy weather, uh, the entire crew's up. The entire crew is up. Um, you know, it's, it's bad to, to wake them up downstairs, but don't, everybody needs to come on deck because that is when problems happen. Um, when you need to have someone go up deck, that is number one going to be, anything you do on the boat that's going to be somewhat risky, make sure you have your whole crew ready to go and know what's going on. So that if something happens, you don't have to sit there going, oh my God, get the guys up. What, what happened? What happened? What happened? Oh, Bob just fell over. <laughs> yeah. That you want to make sure that, that you have everybody knowing exactly what's going on. And if you have people go up, make sure they're clipped in. Make sure you have your jack lines already done ahead of time. And that they know exactly how to go up for it, what they're going to do, how to get the sails down, how to do things like that. Um, uh, hand signals are important. If you don't have radios, which I don't, I don't think many people do, um, you know, make sure you have your hand signals down. Whoever's going to go up front, Know your communication between your captain and your other crew and the people who are going to be up in front. Because if you're trying to yell, if it's blowing 40 knots and the waves are going, and you try to yell, oh my god, what's going on? No, it's not going to work very well. You know, like, pull the thing down. It's like, pull oh, what thing down? I don't hear you. So make sure you have um, uh, your, your hand signals, your plan, and get back as soon as you possibly can to the safety of the cockpit. Uh, 
Lightning, um, so you're in a storm, you're in a thunderstorm, and it's lightning all over the place. I, I think lightning is more scary than it really should be. Uh, I, I know you're on a boat with a pointy, long, pointy thing on it that you're going to think that you're going to get hit. Um, you might get hit. Uh, the one thing that Jen and I always did was we put our, uh, our what is it, our VHF, uh, GPS, and a cell phone in a microwave. Um, our boat's a cruising boat that we're racing, so we have a microwave. If you have one, I would suggest maybe doing that if you're in a lightning storm. Because if you do get hit by lightning, prepare to have all your electronics switched off, right? You're still on the sailboat. You still know that coast, if you're going to Port Aransas, is on the right. <laughs> if you're coming back, it's on the left. Um, so you don't know, need electronics, but they're really handy. And if you're not prepared to lose your entire electronics, then you Put, should probably think about that if you're starting to like it. Uh, just have that thing in your head of like, what would I do if I didn't have GPS? What would I do if I didn't have my heading? What would I do if I didn't have my wind meter? What would I do if I didn't have my lights or anything, right? Um, just have that in your head of, of what is a possibility because, I mean, we, we, I mean, so five years ago, we got in how many lightning storms? Countless lightning storms, and we got hit once. Yeah, and it sucks. It just is more of a monetary suck than, <laughs> than you know, if we survive, it's fine. We had our GPS, our handheld GPS and everything, so we were, we were fine, but it's just, it's just not a fun thing to do. You won't, I don't think you get it that hurt, but yeah, don't get hit by lightning. That's the rule of rule. All right, so in big, big weather, there's usually big waves, right? Um, if you haven't sailed in big waves, uh, it could be daunting. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things out there on how to do it. A lot of it comes down to experience. Um, you know, especially if they're cresting, don't, don't go right up on a cresting wave and then slam your boat down. Try to go up the wave and then back down and, you know, easily, a little peacefully. Um, when the waves get bigger, the good news is I think we're racing in, um, like, what's the max depth of what we would probably be in? Maybe 200 feet or so. So we're not going to have 100 foot waves, you know, so I don't think it's possible. Physics, physics uh, denies that. But we might have, you know, 10, 15 foot waves potentially, and they are not fun, um, especially if the period is, is, is steep. So, you know, just know how to get through big waves. Um, there's a lot of articles and stuff about it, but especially if it's behind you, so if it's behind you in surfing, surfing can be dangerous too on smaller boats. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think I was out on a Bermuda, Inkley Bermuda 41 uh, in Bermuda, um, and uh, the we weren't supposed to be out there. We probably shouldn't have been out there, but it was supposed to be 40 knots, and it turned into 70 at uh, 90. The little wind doohickey thing, anometer or whatever. Uh, apparently, they can't go much more than 90 because it blew off. <laughs> I think it was probably 100, 110 is what probably was the max. The waves built to 50, 55 or so. And uh, and a 40 foot boat on a 55 foot wave, it's you learn how to drive with waves pretty easily, not pretty pretty quickly. Um, but there's waves to surf, and I say I think the one thing that almost killed us was our companion wave hatch wasn't good enough. And if you have a smaller boat. A low freeboard boat, um, and or if you have an open boat, uh, make sure your patches are in if you're going to have breaking waves behind you. Um, one wave, just a random wave that's maybe two to five feet bigger than the other ones that breaks on you and you're not sailing it appropriately, can swamp your whole boat and cause a lot of problems. And all that water down in the cockpit or down in, in below can ruin your electronics and ruin your day. Um, so make sure that I don't, I don't think it's going to happen here, but be cognizant of, of hatches that are open, of, of companion waves that are open, uh, because waves can can potentially be bad if you have a smaller boat. Um, and surfing down waves, you know, if you surf the wrong way and you get sideways to it, you can go over on a small boat. Again, I don't think it's going to be a big problem, but but I still want to mention it just because it could could get nasty out there could potentially. Uh, so. It just got really bad. What do we do? Um, you're the captain. You have to decide what what the situation is on your boat. 
If you prepared yourself, if you knew what the weather was, you got your boat totally prepared, um, and you reefed, and you think you're doing good, and your crew morale is high, then continue, keep going. Um, if you didn't know the wind was coming, if you didn't reef, if you didn't prepare your boat, if you start having problems, consider just withdrawing from the race. It's only a race, you know? Don't, don't take this as something that you have to, you know, keep winning. You can come back next year. If, 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 if it's the number one thing I think is not winning the race, it is getting all your people to Port Aransas, or even possibly turning back, right? Um, you know, I think in 2010, was it 2010, there was that all low that formed off uh, down in, in like near uh, Corpus or somewhere down there, near the race course, it was a little bit farther down. Um, and it started blowing 30 on the nose and the waves were about, I don't know, 10 to 12. And we had the boat under contract and we were racing it. And we're just pounding, pounding, and pounding. And I'm looking at myself going, why are we doing this? And we won that year, first back to Lakewood. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that was the best decision for us. I think, you know, everybody has to be their own captain. And, and decide what is going on. If if you're in the, if you're having problems and you're considering um, that turning on your engine is going to disqualify you from the race, think about your crew and safety of your boat and what that matters to you. If it matters more for winning that trophy or more for turning on the engine to make sure that you can get into the wind, take your sails down, and be safe and get in to enjoy the party or get back safely home so that you can see your you know, wife and kids or family or whatever like that. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and then always know where close harbor is. So if you all of a sudden are out there and you decide, okay, this is not for me, I really need to get in, know along the way as captain, know, okay, we just started the race, where's my next port? Well, next one's gonna be Freeport, you know, and so on. Tom uh, Collier's gonna talk more about safe harbors. Know where the safe harbors are, and always have them in the back of your head that I can still go into their coastal and get back safely if I don't wanna be out here anymore. Um, and then number, also another rule is don't panic. You know, just keep your head clear and just try to make the best decision you possibly can. Um, you know, you're your own captain out there of your own vessel. No one's gonna be out there um, telling you what to do. Uh, you know, the Coast Guard, they all were nice here. They were all, all said, we'll come rescue you. They really don't want to rescue us. <laughs> I mean, they would like to just be at home too. Um, they, they're not, that they'll do it. They're trained for it. But, you know, my, my thought is never, never have a situation where you have to call them. It's great if the situation gets out of your control, if something that comes out of your plan that happens, that it's awesome that they're there. But don't make it so they have to come and rescue you. I think that's, that's a big one, so. And on that, do we have any questions? Oh, no, we see, yeah, I have to wrap up, okay. Yeah, know the weather, prepare your boat, decide if you wanna race based on your knowledge, and you know, execute your plan. I think that, that was my wrap up, so. Any questions? Okay, everybody knows how to do bad weather now, that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Jay.